Welcome to this episode of uh, uh, The Keys to Avoiding Trouble. This is Track's commitment to Beyond the Boat, a number of programs designed to help uh, provide a life unleashed for you to be in, on, and around the water with greater success. Uh, this particular program, Keys to Avoiding Your Trouble, is a program for intermediate and advanced paddlers, uh, or at least those concepts that center around uh, leadership, risk management, and skills development uh, to help you be more effective and safe in uh, your uh, programs and efforts and experiences uh, on the water, ideally in your track sea kayak but uh, applicable across the board. I've got a couple of really great um, uh, guests on today uh, that I, I want to introduce. And um, uh, this is a little bit of a departure from our original format. And uh, I'm very excited about this particular program because uh, we just ran a fantastic camp uh, out on the wild wet west coast against all odds. We went to the Pacific Rim seashore on the west coast of Vancouver Island and ran a surf camp that was a skills progression uh, for uh, skills development to help people develop their confidence and competence making surf landings and surf launchings uh, in the tri kayak and then we sort of took that a step further and applied these foundational skills in a way that we could really get some stoke in some recreational paddling scenarios. So uh, what's really great about this call uh, is that not only do we have uh, uh, a co-instructor with me, Keith Braun on the line, um, but we also have a number of participants that were actually at the camp. And so um, uh, first I wanna uh, just introduce and bring on Keith. Uh, Keith and I are both track pilots and um, uh, Keith has actually been with, uh, with track longer than probably anybody in this forum with the exception of Nolan and uh, uh, is a, um, uh, a professional realtor uh, in, a, in a day job, but also a uh, committed guide and educator in, in sea kayaking and uh, has a strong commitment to giving back to the community in lots of ways uh, uh, with education and uh, contributions to track as well as other organizations. But um, uh, he was one of the leaders on the track camp with me, along with Francine, who's also on this call. And uh, we were supported uh, really tremendously by track uh, HQ, including Curtis Heron, who's on the call, as well as Nolan. And we'll introduce some of those participants as we, uh, as we roll in here. But um, uh, Keith, welcome to the call. Thank you so much for co-hosting with me, and uh, I look forward to this discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to it as well, Hans. So, so Keith and I just came off uh, working this camp with uh, a number of folks that are on this call. And uh, um, I've just explained the goal of the camp, uh, which was not only to increase competence and confidence on the surf landing and surf launching component, but also to really uh, role model uh, effective risk management and running groups that can be translated into really paddling with your peers and uh, for any of us to put together uh, expeditions or trips. Uh, some of the same things that we used for uh, consideration on risk management on this trip are completely transferable and usable uh, onto your own personal trips, whatever their length uh, and duration, whether it's a day trip or uh, whether it's a multi-day expedition. So what I wanted to do in this particular call, Keith, is I wanted to explore some of the frameworks for risk management uh, that we used, uh, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, we're in an inherently hazardous scenario. Um, and uh, we, you know, are to help us really kind of balance uh, taking enough risk so that we're really uh, learning effectively and it's exciting and we're leaving feeling really satisfied and fulfilled, but not so much that it compromises our ability to make decisions or to learn and uh, or to terrify us. <laughs> and so uh, that's kind of the goal of this call. So I, I want to explore that with you and uh, present some of the frameworks we used, but also I think to invite people that are on this call to really have a discussion and to come up with some possibly some other uh, frameworks that other folks have used historically to be able to, uh, to, to, to manage risk, if you will. So, um, you know, I open the floor to you, Keith, just to uh, introduce yourself and, and your takeaways from the camp. Sure, absolutely. 
So I see a lot of familiar faces and I see some new faces. Um, so good to see a lot of you and I hope to see many more of you on the water some, sometime soon in the future. Um, yeah, it was a fantastic year out on the, on the Pacific Rim and uh, we saw what really um, fills my cup is when I see people progress in their skills. And, and I think that was a common theme this year. Everybody progressed in, in, you know, from where they started to where they finished five days later, they all felt like they were, um, they learned a lot and then they could apply a lot from what they learned to their day-to-day -day paddling skills. So, um, so, you know, I, I don't know, Hans, what, uh, where do you want to start as far as risk management? Uh, let's start, I think, with, um, let's first just acknowledge, I think, some of the people that were on the trip. So there's a point of reference. And then let's dive into a little bit on kind of, uh, I guess there's two models we can present here. One is the, 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 the peer model that you brought in on a previous, on a, on a previous podcast. Uh, but we can just talk about how we sort of uh, use that from a big picture perspective as we kind of design the camp. And let me first start just by acknowledging mm -hmm. some of the people that are on the line. Um, first of all, Francine, uh, who you can see there, Francine, you can, you can wave and unmute if you want to uh, um, introduce yourself. But Francine, uh, from a risk management perspective, played a really big part. Uh, one of her um, accountabilities was uh, a health and safety and wellness coordinator. And she did this in a number of ways. Uh, when first when people first came to the camp, she uh, took the leadership role of uh, really doing a health check with people, of uh, making sure that the standards that we had for participation uh, were met. Uh, and then um, was able to establish a baseline subjectively uh, with those people on on where they were, uh, both emotionally and physically, um, and points of their wellness. And then she also um, led a movement session every morning with us to uh, help uh, in injury prevention um, and to grow our capacities as paddlers, as well as another opportunity for her to observe um, how people were showing up for that relative to the baseline she established. So that was one of the things we had going on from a risk management perspective from the very spot start. So Francine, welcome to the call. Thank you. Go ahead, Francine. Welcome. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, this was my second year at uh, the track camp, and it was really wonderful uh, in my role to be able to connect with each and everyone as individuals and checking in with them um, to see where they were at as, as the camp progress, things change. So um, daily things such as possibly um, the body start talking in different ways, having a little bit of pains and aches. And I was just helping people to manage this along the way so that they were they would still stay within the, the safety zone and still be able to play in, in a safe and good way. So I, I was really honored to, um, to have that role and to be able to help people um, follow through with their kayak camp. Terrific. Excellent. Thank you, Francine. So I invite you to participate in this um, as one of the leaders, as one of the uh, kind of risk managers on, on the group. I'd also like to acknowledge um, uh, some of the participants that were on. Um, uh, but first, uh, let me also introduce Jason, who came out from Track HQ, and his role in terms of risk management as a, as a multi-year participant and a representative for Track HQ was also to just make sure that all the gear uh, was, uh, was in functional order and to inspect all that and uh, to ensure that we had what we needed that was in good shape and good repair to be able to... Um, ensure we didn't have equipment failure uh, as a part of risk management. <clears throat> Jason, welcome to the call. Yeah, thanks for that, Hans. Yeah, and I agree. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that goes into a, a, a good comprehensive risk management sort of framework to work from and making sure that your equipment is safe, ready, and well-maintained is, uh, is one of the building blocks of that for sure, yeah. Sure, yeah, equipment failure is often uh, not one of the things that uh, is um, uh, you know, gets us into deep trouble. Uh, it's usually user error. You know, right. if, if the if the uh, if the uh, float uh, if the float bag or the um, 
or the uh, let's say the paddle float washes off your deck and you weren't able to use it, uh, that's not equipment failure. <laughs> that's uh, that's that, that's pilot error. Uh, but um, uh, you know, having the boats in good working order were part of that. So very preemptively, thank you for your support on that, Jason. So the other people I'd like to acknowledge, Ken Poole was uh, was actually on the camp. So I'd love to get your reflections, Ken, as we move through this uh, as a participant. Um, uh, as well as uh, Tish uh, Doyle Baker. You can wave there, Tish. Great, great to see you. Um, she was also on this camp. I'd love to get her reflections as we move through and any contributions you'd have about how you can use some of the things that you saw in your setting up your paddling adventures moving forward. And Connie uh, Laburn is on the call. Hi, Connie. Good to see you, Miss Laburn. And then um, who else do we have? Uh, we have. Uh, Curtis, who is not on the uh, on the surf camp, but he's participated before and was a great support on the back end, largely helping keep keeping people informed, getting them the pre-trip information they needed uh, to make the decisions uh, that they need to get there on time um, and with everything that was required. And then, of course, um, Nolan Villard, who uh, is the managing director of, um, of track, and he's at HQ and was very supportive in this camp and helped us. Uh, certainly allocate the resources we needed to uh, run the camp in a really effective and safe way from a risk management. So having the support uh, of, uh, of everything we needed from HQ, from shipping products to budgets uh, to hiring, you know, top talent to run these things are, are commitments that, uh, that, that track made to pull this off with success. So that's a little bit, you know, that's a little bit of where, the risk management for being on the water actually started. It was months before uh, we actually ran the camp. And frankly, we ran this against all odds given the current situation. So um, uh, Nolan, welcome to the call. Thanks Hans. Yeah, it was, um, it was super important, I think, to, uh, to make it work, you know, and, and like you said, the risk management aspect, you know, started with this pandemic response and, you know, um, obviously, we weren't able to uh, bring people in from other parts of the world that were wanting to come to this camp. Um, so we had to do it as a Canadian only, but we had a lot of um, meetings and, and, you know, strategy sessions on how we were going to pull it off because it's such an expression of what, we're, what we offer at track and what is important to us and what we know is important for everyone is building your skills and getting out there and really enjoying uh, your paddling. And so... Um, you know, we, we didn't want to let the current year, um, you know, kibosh plans to, to give people an experience that would have them really prepared and, and excited about their next paddling adventure. So um, that was super important. But uh, equal acknowledgement back to Hans and to Francine and, and, uh, and Keith and Cole, uh, who isn't on this call, but Cole was a big part of it as well. Uh, and for all the participants, like all of you guys that showed up, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and took it on uh, this, you know, it really says a lot about who you are and what you're committed to for your own life and vitality and your own commitment to sea kayaking. So, you know, that to me is a huge, uh, it speaks volumes. Um, those of you who, who, you know, stepped up and, and made it happen. And it sounds, I wished I could have made my way out there this year and been with you. Uh, wasn't gonna wasn't gonna happen this time around uh, with a lot of other commitments back here at HQ. But uh, uh, really pleased that that everyone uh, enjoyed the experience, and I'm looking forward to hearing it be unpacked here on this call. So I'll. Uh, Terrific. Thanks. Pass Noah. it back to you, Hans. Thanks. So one of the things that we did, you know, I think where risk management started for us was um, was certainly uh, taking all the moving parts that we had at the moment that we were, you know, the, 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 the camp was sort of in design stage and more imminent um, as a team starting to come together. And one of the models that we've uh, that we've really spoken about um, uh, in uh, both in the camp as well as that uh, that we the, as the leadership team used during the camp is uh, something that was expressed by uh, kayak instructor Keith Braun, track pilot, um, uh, in a previous episode. And I'm going to share that link with you right now. It's a YouTube link on a on a um, uh, just a risk management model that we typically apply to pod management um, that uh, that Keith you came up with. Um, 
So Keith, why don't we just walk through that at the high level um, and then we can present possibly kind of a decision-making tool later. But um, let's talk about how we used peer model going into this, um, what it is and how people can, um, uh, can use that on their own trips. Sure, yeah, on a very basic level, PEER, P-E-E-R, is an acronym. Uh, it just came up when I was putting together a presentation for TRAC um, a few months ago on risk management. And uh, P stands for plan, and uh, it's quite extensive, the planning element of it. If any of you have ever planned a trip for a group of people, you probably know that uh, there's a lot involved, a lot of, as, as Hans mentioned, a lot of moving parts a lot of logistics to pull it together um, successfully. And, uh, you know, I've always said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And uh, it's, it's certainly a, a saying worth living by because, uh, you know, on the front end, if, if work isn't done on the front end, then it's, then it's uh, realized on the back end of, of, of your trip. So this, this extent, sorry, go ahead, Hans. I think you're in yeah, so let's talk about some of the things that we did on the on the planning thing. Uh, just for context, people can understand this, is that like many sure. expeditions, we had some last minute changes. We had uh, uh, a couple of folks that wanted to, that, you know, raise their hand and said, hey, I really want to come make this happen and participate in this camp relatively last minute. Uh, the other thing that we had going on is that um, we also had one of our instructor team uh, that we had counted on also uh, have to disengage last minute. Um, and one of the things that's important in a, in a risk management scenario is that from a planning perspective, it's really helpful that if you have a, a, a continuum of skill sets where you're represented on both ends of it, <laughs> um, is that you have a good ratio of experience to inexperience. And mm -hmm. um, uh, this plays out really um important in an institutional kayak setting where there are uh, there's a dynamic of guides or instructors relative to participants or students um, and so what we're shooting for is um, kind of a minimum of four to one um, and so that's the first risk management piece that we had from planning perspectives how do we make sure that we've got a, at least a four to one ratio on the water all the time so um, how you could apply this into your own personal trips is if you have more experienced people, make sure that you've got a good balance of, uh, of, of, of experience relative to, to folks that are new, um, of course, you know, given, given the set of conditions. But uh, that can be super helpful. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just interject on that. So um, one, of the, one of the pieces um, within the framework of planning is is understanding your audience or understanding your team. And um, so, you know, I mean, it can, it can dial into a simple uh, one day trip or it can be a multi-day trip, but what's really important is that you understand who you're inviting into that trip or into that program and, and, and learning their capabilities. And you can better understand then, you know, how well that group, um, the dynamics of that group fits into the waters that you plan to paddle. So, yeah. You know, if you don't have a strong enough team for the waters that you initially plan to paddle, you got to re, you got to, you got to change your plan because the the your your the dynamics of your group have to match the water that you're paddling. And so we did that with tracks through profiling. And um, for those of you that attended Tish and uh, the rest of you, it, it, you, you probably remember filling out a profile um, that would enabled us to. Um, understand our audience better and then know how we could manage the program and mitigate the risk around your capabilities. So super important. Great. You know, the other thing that I would say to the plan piece that was specific to this, uh, this particular experience, uh, Keith, is we chose a venue um, uh, that would allow us to operate within almost any normal meteorological condition. <laughs> um, we were there last year and the same place we were um, in the bay had, you know, huge breaking waves. <laughs> um, mm. uh, and that was an extreme case, but we could still operate in that. Um, and then, you know, and we didn't have to go very far. Uh, in this particular uh, session, uh, the, the meteorological conditions were much different and we had to actually travel to find the conditions we needed for um, really helping bring the surf skills together. 
Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was a planning piece that was critical. We had a venue that we knew we could use, even if the worst case scenario from a weather perspective panned out. You know, if we had 50 knot uh, winds from the, no from the north, uh, west, we could still make it work. Totally. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, it, uh, uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen that way like it did last year. Um, so uh, the planning piece is pretty critical. Um, let's move on to the, uh, to, the, to the next big piece was educate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so after you've planned your, your, your program or you planned your, your day trip or your multi-day trip and you understand um, what your goals and objectives are, you understand your team and uh, it all lines up, uh, the next thing is, is educate. You have to make sure that everyone understands fully um, what to expect and what the goals, goals and objectives are. And by taking the time to, to educate your, your team or um, on, on what's coming up, the, they can better also um, plan personally for, for what's to come. So um, keeping your people in the dark is, is, is not beneficial at all. You've got to make sure that everybody fully understands the goals and objectives of the trip or the program that you're running and, um, and, and keep them informed as things change as well, which Hans can speak to. There is, there are some changes that we need to make in this program to not just meet the needs of, of, of the clientele or the, or the participants that were there, but also, um, of the goals and objectives of the, of the, of the trip. So terrific. Ed and, educate, uh, educate, educate. Yeah, so, so some of the things that we did specifically is we had several pre-trip meetings um, as an instructor team. Uh, and we had them virtually, we had them on Zoom. Uh, we documented that uh, we had a, um, both a rough structure in terms of objectives and skills for kind of every day. Uh, and then we had a more detailed as a baseline. And then we um, were all clear about that going into actually meeting participants but then when the participants uh, showed up, we then basically heard from them what their priorities were and then were able to overlay that and adjust. Um, and then educate back. And um, so that was, uh, uh, I, think, I, I think then um, uh, we were then able to kind of present on a, on a, on a daily basis and a big picture, really what we were going to do uh, and enroll people in taking self-responsibility for that as well. Um, uh, so far, I'd like to just uh, kind of hear from maybe some of the participants that were there uh, from a big picture perspective, how did we do on the plan and educate part so far? Tish. Oh, you got to unmute Tish, you're all unmuting. Just give me a sec, there you go. Go ahead Tish. Oh, I think, wait a just, I think she has to unmute herself. Oh, uh, yeah. You have to, there you go. Maybe she just doesn't have a speaker or a microphone. Yeah, set. I'm thinking, sorry, Tish. You know, I can hear you in, in spirit. <laughs> cool. Ken, Ken, how about you? What would you like to know? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> How did we do as far as um, pre-planning and education going into the program? Did you feel like you're well-prepared going in and you knew what to expect? I think I had a good idea as much as you could have prepared me that way. Um, I mm -hmm. still, you know, didn't know what I didn't know. Um, but it was certainly reassuring to be presented with the information you passed on and prepared me with. And so when I finally got out there, I didn't feel like I was, uh, that I was surprised. I just didn't know if I would be surprised. Okay, yeah. 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 Cool, terrific. So let's move on. What's the next level of, of the peer model that we use kind of going into the camp? Yeah, and just to, just to reiterate, guys, we're blown through this really, really fast for the sake of time. And, uh, and Hans has put a, a link up there for you to dive deeper into it, should you choose to. Um, so again, the, the acronym is PEER, P-E-E-R, and the first one's PLAN, and the second one is EDUCATE, and the third one is the funnest part, it's, a, it's, it's EXECUTE. So you've taken all this time and effort into, into planning your, your program or planning your day trip or planning your multi-day trip. 
and uh, and you've taken the time to educate your people. Now you need to execute. And uh, there's definitely some some important pieces to put in there. Um, there's some acronyms that we can typically live by when we're on the water as we continually. And the important thing is is when you're executing a plan, um, you have to you have to be incredibly flexible because not always do you have does everything come to come to fruition that you've planned. There's a lot of uncontrollables. Um, one of them is people. Um, there's different variables that come into play with regards to, to managing the people you've chosen to paddle with. The other thing is, is weather and sea state. Those things are variables that change and you have very little control over. So you have to be incredibly flexible. Um, one acronym or one saying that Cole uses all the time that I really like is called me, we, the, southern, the weather and the sea. And uh, so it just rhymes and it's easy to remember and it's something that you can apply while paddling. So when you think of me, you think of yourself. How are you feeling? What's your intuition? What's your discernment? Um, how are you feeling about things? Are you calm about things or are you actually feeling a little unsettled? You're likely going to be, if you're the one planning a trip, you're likely going to be one of the, the most competent and experienced people on the water. So if you're feeling uneasy about things, then just imagine how the lesser experienced people are going to feel. They're going to feel way outside of their comfort zone. So think of me, think of we, meaning the group. Um, how is the group doing? Stop and ask your group uh, how they're doing. Um, the weather, obviously, that's, that's you know, self-explanatory. In the sea, that's also self-explanatory. So me, we, the weather, and the sea, thank you, Cole, for that contribution. And, um, and those, are, those are four things to ask yourself continually while you're on the water. Um, one thing I'll add into that is what I call waypoints and what Cole calls the transitional points. I, I love transitional points because it makes good sense. So if you're paddling around a point and, uh, and there's a transition in weather state or sea state, um, that's why he refers to it as a, as a transitional point, always stop at those points and pre-plan those points in your, in your floor plan so that you know that you're going to stop and you're going to reassess. And you'll reassess those four things again, me, we, the weather, and the sea. And, and decide whether it's safe to continue on or whether it needs to be some flexibility applied into your, into your full plan and you adjust accordingly. So um, that's one of, of many acronyms that I'll throw in there today. So just remember me, we, the weather, and the sea. And think of Cole when you do that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I think one of the things um, that, uh, about this particular uh, element of, um, of the peer model, uh, Keith, is this is where everyone jumps to. This is what we all want. Uh, this is the easy part for us to do. Typically is the execution part, but it's often, uh, it can get detached from the plan. It can get detached from the education piece. And there's gotta be continuity and congruence with that um, in order for it to work. Um, and so one of the things that I like about uh, um, this idea that you've uh, introduced with execute is that constant reevaluation. I think there's one takeaway uh, for uh, people to have today and that I'd like to get across um, is that no matter what kind of tool or framework you're using, um, uh, the execute part requires constant reevaluation um, and making a decision from one waypoint to the next transition period isn't a commitment or a, or a promise to get to the end. Um, it's just to, it's just a, it's just a decision to move to the next transition. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the mo most important thing when you're standing on the beach and you're, you know, you just woke up and you're like, okay, do we pack the boats? Um, it's blowing only 10 knots out there you're only making a decision to pack the boats. You're not making a decision to push off and commit to a 20 mile downwind passage with no takeouts. And so um, it's important uh, that you're going from transition to transition to transition um, mm -hmm. and only committing to that and knowing, um, you know, when you're, how long you're committed to the next one. There's one thing I want to share with folks that's helpful in this, uh, in this execution model um, that relates very closely to the, you know, me, we, weather, and the sea. It's the track decision-making uh, triangle. Um, and I've just included that asset uh, there in the chat room. You can open that up and take a look at that. But that's a really great way on, from the execution side to look at two different things. Um, and uh, I think I'm just going to bring this up. Um, and possibly share this if I can. It's very common to um, uh, what uh, uh, what track uh, what what your 
what your transition concept is, but also to track to, to Cole's idea of me, we, the weather, and the sea. And uh, from the execute perspective, I'd like to break kind of all decision making down into kind of two different potential um, hazards. You know, one hazard is that there are, there are subjective hazards, and that's the human factor. That's us. That's, you know, my strength, my capabilities, how am I feeling today? Um, uh, how is the team doing? Uh, all those things that are hugely dynamic and they're human factors that are purely subjective. Um, and to separate that completely from the objective hazards, which are the weather, the sea state, and the route or the terrain. Um, and so, uh, you know, another way to kind of frame that me, we, weather, and the sea is the, uh, you know, look out, look, or look up, look out, look down, and look around um, for bringing in both subjective and objective hazards. Same concept, but uh, I think the critical part that we did in the surf camp and that we, that we as leaders do in expeditions is we recognize what are those transitional periods and to see them as opportunities to make decisions. And I guess one example that I can share with you um, that's really poignant on the, um, on, the, uh, on the surf camp from this experience is we were getting ready to take about a, um, a five nautical mile passage down a pretty um, exposed section of the coast on the west coast that's open to the Pacific on, on the west and to the east has some rocky outcroppings and a uh, and a relatively remote beach with potentially breaking waves on it. Um, and so prior to making the choice to go, uh, we, what we uh, after breakfast, we walked out to the point um, and took a visual uh, from what we knew from the weather forecast, from what we knew about the route and the terrain from having done a passage plan the night before and briefed everybody out in the morning is we walked out to the point to do a reality check. Okay, it's what we're seeing consistent with the forecast. It's what we're seeing, um, uh, you know, can we put a visual to the kind of terrain we're gonna be having to paddle by looking at this point, you can see what the sea and the swell and the, and, and the period is doing on those rocks. Uh, do I wanna be in that? And we went out there and we used a red light, green light, yellow light scenario and um, uh, for the weather and the sea state and the route and the terrain, we came up with yellow lights across the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, and frankly, on the human factors, we came up with a yellow light too. If, you know, if things had not changed uh, from a yellow setting, um, we may not have gone. But we made that observation and we made a decision, okay, well, let's make a decision just to get down to the beach, move to the boats, the water, and get in the boats. So we did that. Um, and then there's another decision, you know, point that's a transition point. Once you're on the water, then you decide, okay, now what do we do? Do we poke our heads out and look, or do we go back to the beach? <laughs> Another transition point. Um, mm -hmm. And fortunately what happened uh, from the time that we were out on the point and conditions were building, um, they actually started diminishing. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went from, uh, you know, uh, caution in all the areas that we were suggest, you know, that we were looking at to now green. Um, and that opened the window for us to go. Um, and so what the pod did was to just go out and uh, poke their noses around, around the corner. Keith, you were on the water with the crew. I was not. What was that uh, transition point like for you? What was going through your mind? Oh, I was just having a good time. But uh, what I could tell um, based upon our, peer, uh, our, our pod management was uh, there were some mixed feelings in the group as far as capabilities go and comfort level on the water. Um, you're right. As we passed past the point, um, you know, the, the water's built. It, it was it was well within the scope of the of the group, but um, outside of maybe the comfort level of some of the people. And uh, we talked, to, you know, during the program about uh, what zone are you in? Are you in your comfort zone? Are you in your learning zone? Are you in your panic zone? Well, at no time while we were out there, especially just beyond the point, were we in a panic zone? But definitely in a learning zone, people were learning their, their own capabilities and understanding that they had, um, that the, they, they were actually able to manage water that was beyond their perceived capability, which I love. It's beautiful. But at the same time, do it in a safe fashion. So they're um, safely managed within a group. And uh, the leaders were um, both fore and aft and on each side of the group. And um, 
everyone was well managed and um and then what happened was things calmed down and, and i think that overall the even the 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 the, the demeanor of, of of a lot of the group calmed down as well and really started enjoying the the, the rest of the passage so Terrific, thank you. I'll tell you, we'll, I'll add to that uh, one thing that we did do, one decision we made as a leadership team is that, uh, you know, we had the option of going in uh, multiple pods or a single pod. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, given that we kind of stood out in the point and um, all, you know, all lights were yellow at the time, um, uh, we decided that, hey, let's go as a super pod. Let's keep strength in numbers. Let's keep our ratio of more experienced paddlers to less experienced paddlers stacked in our favor. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that's important about that is had we divided, the tendency is to divide between, oh, experience will go first because they're going to go faster and less experience will go slower. And, uh, and so you can, you know, that's a natural tendency um, in those decisions. So when you're on the water with your peers, uh, you know, consider that, you know, how tight a pod management do you need to have for safety? Um, and that's a more important consideration than, you know, how quick we collectively or individually get there. But Keith, I want to bring in something and put into context what you referenced, which is really valuable. And I can't screen share this for some reason, my iPad's not um, uh, sort of recognizing uh, this computer, but I just pulled this pad I had over here. I'll just bring it up. Um, one of the models, and I'll, and I'll say that uh, it's an objective that we had while we were out there. I'm going to draw, um, you know, kind of a circle that represents our comfort zone. Um, and this is where we're feeling really safe. Uh, if you're there to learn, it's often can be kind of boring. Um, it's not that stimulating, but you really feel in control and super comfortable. Um, uh, so the comfort zone uh, is, is where we are uh, most of the time in our lives. But what we're trying to do in the camp is we're trying to extend that just a little bit. Um, and what we encourage people to do uh, on this camp is to recognize where are you exactly at all times. Um, recognize when you're in your comfort zone because you need to be able to step out of that a little bit for effective learning. Uh, and this is what we call... Uh, what Keith referred to as the learning zone, just slightly out of your comfort zone. Um, but one has to be really attuned to that in order to, you know, have some control about how they step out of that and when to bring that back in. Because just outside of the learning zone uh, that's here, um, you know, is uh, basically the, the panic zone. Hey Hans, just for yeah. effective visual, um, if you, take off the decision-making triangle, the, oh. uh, then people will be able to see that out, you know, your, your pad better. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So this is a, this is one of our, this is one of our objectives in terms of the course is let's really, you know, orient us as a, as an expedition around this. Let's make sure we articulate this to the, to the, to all the crew instructors and students. Um, and let's, you know, put it on everyone that their responsibility is to uh, is to largely live here in the learning zone and to, you know, try to stay out of this, or at least if you're there, really articulate that so that we can dial that back a little bit. And so as you're either leading expeditions or developing your own skills, uh, being attuned to this and knowing where you are, whether you're in the comfort zone, the learning zone, or the panic zone uh, is really critical to effective learning. Um, and, uh, and making sure that it's uh, safe for you paddling with your peers as well. Anything else you would add to, uh, to that piece, Keith? No, I don't think so. I think it's, um, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add to that is, is to encourage people to get out of your comfort zone. Um, I do paddle with, with a person that, um, is really uncomfortable with paddling in wind and, um, uh, and I've, can, I've encouraged her over and over again to say, well, listen, let's get out into a situation where we have lots of wind in, in a safe environment and, and get you comfortable with that because that's, that's a reality of kayaking is that eventually you're going to be paddling in wind. And so um, I, just, I would just say that to all of you. Pick your own comfort zones and your learning zone. Those are your learning zones and, uh, and choose somebody who's competent. Uh, to be able to take you out into that space and learn to be comfortable in that space and you'll build upon your skills as a personal, um, your personal skills as a kayaker. 
much better by doing that rather than staying in your comfort zone all the time. Cool. Um, thank you for that, Keith. The one other thing that I'm uh, that I want to share here as a kind of a uh, an assumption and one of the ways that we operated as a team. Um, uh, Keith, you presented this in your risk management class on the, uh, you know, as part of that during the night before our passage. But one model I just want to share with people, there's a lot of ways to look at risk management as an equation. But if we can systematize the idea of risk management, a simple model can often help us, a way to think about it. Um, and uh, uh, you've got uh, sort of two, in my mind, uh, there's two continuums, right? One is a continuum that is, okay, what are the consequences of an event happening that increase um, uh, depending on what that event is. And, uh, you know, and then there's a probability of that event happening or the likelihood of that event happening. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you can plot on that. You know, brushing my teeth while I'm walking has a certain consequence um, <laughs> and a certain likelihood <laughs> of an event. So I could, you know, I could, I could plot that, uh, right? Um, you know, going out uh, above my... Uh, ability level in huge surf with strong offshore winds um, by myself. So paddling, you know, has a, uh, you know, has a different uh, data point of consequence versus probability. And somewhere along this line, you can, somewhere along this, this, this set of data points, you can draw a line. Um, on this side, everything, you know, it's an unacceptable risk. And on this side of whatever that line is, is an acceptable risk. And so one of the things as an instructor team or, or guides that we do is we, you know, we're constantly kind of running this, this in our minds and uh, we've got a commitment to each other is that we're going to stay within this acceptable zone. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll have another conversation about, uh, about, you know, the stages of learning, maybe on another call. <laughs> but, uh, but everyone that was in a leadership position on that, in a designated leadership position on that, uh, was very uh, consciously competent um, and could make these kinds of decisions and could discern between, you know, what was acceptable and what was like, unacceptable because they had the, um, the experience to know what the consequences might be as well as the probability of an event happening. So those are the two assumptions that we're making is A, we're gonna keep people just out of their comfort zone. We're gonna share some of that, but we're gonna uh, pass the responsibility on to the, to the individual paddlers. And collectively, we're gonna stay here. Uh, and we're gonna check in on that. Uh, so let's move on to the, to the next part of the peer model. Cool. Um, before we do that, let me just, let me just um, uh, say something rude with regards to what you were just talking about. Um, we're talking about the peer model, um, but there's also a, another element that, that runs parallel with that, and that's peer pressure. And uh, mm -hmm. so as, as good leaders um, managing a group of, of paddlers, you need to understand what the lowest common denominator is in your group mm -hmm. and cater to that. Um, because oftentimes the most outspoken people within your group are going to be the people that are most excited about what's ahead of them. And, uh, and so as a good leader of, a, of pod management, you need to recognize that it might be within the capability um, or skill set of one or two of the powers, but maybe one or two of the other powers are not or outside of that. They're now in their panic zone. So you have to be as a leader, be okay with making the non-democratic you know, decision on saying, no, as a leader of this group, we are not going to do this passage or we're not going to do this rock gardening section because it's just not safe for the whole group, right? Yep. So, be, so be okay with that. Um, you guys probably, for some of you, Connie, Tish, Ken, that were on the trip, you probably remember Cole and I going ahead on certain sections and evaluating um, different, different shoots through, uh, between different rocks or shoals. So that was us um, taking that leadership and evaluating the circumstance and deciding, is it okay for Cole and I? Well, yeah, sure, Cole and I could have done it. Was it okay for the group? No, no, it wasn't okay for the group. So we bypassed those that we didn't feel was safe as a group, but we, we definitely executed the ones that we felt the whole group could do. So um, just wanted to give you guys that permission to say no as a leader when it's not safe for the whole group. Okay. 
Um, so the next one in peer, remember P-E-E-R is review, R for review. And uh, so you've had a great day out on the, on the water or a great week out on the water and it's been fabulous. Um, <clears throat> everyone's ready to go their own way. But it would be really, really bad, really sad if, if you couldn't actually stop and review and see how the week went or see how the day went or see how the event went so that you can build upon those learnings and, uh, and move forward to future events and, 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 uh, and grow and learn from, from that day or that week. So review is super important. Terrific. Um, you know, I think some of the things specifically we did on the surf camp with regard to review, Keith, is uh, we maintained a, a designated time in our schedule, which was the coach's corner. Um, and so from a planning perspective, we built the review into our into our structure and our format we had designated and we educated with everyone that from uh you know from 4 30 to 5 um we're going to have a coach's corner uh we're not going to be accessible we're probably going to disappear <laughs> um and so we had a powwow so that we could review what happened uh you know, during the day and make a plan for what are the uh, curriculum goals and route considerations and educational components for the following day so that we could really spell that out to the team at the morning briefing. Now, where I think we failed, uh, Keith, and I think one of the lost opportunities for us is that, you know, we did not really role model uh, as well as I think we should or could have um, daily debriefs as an entire pod um, as an entire course. I think we could have extracted um, more learnings uh, had we effectively uh, role modeled that. And I think we could have helped people impart that in their expeditions. Um, the very important review part, like you're saying, had we uh, more effectively role modeled, what does a good debrief look like? Um, and so that's one of the things that, uh, that, uh, you know, that maybe we can bring into one of these calls in the future. Totally. And uh, I know, I know last year, I, I would admit last year we did a better job of that and it, it occurred around fireside at the end of the day. So there was a lot of transparency and a lot of uh, honesty the, uh, from the group as far as um, the highlights and lowlights of the day, the successes, the failures, the, you know, and, and that really built into the next day. This year, for some reason or another, it just got a bit disjointed on that and that didn't really come out as, as a big success factor. And we all, we all recognize that. But, you know, to, to give a broader perspective on this, you know, if you're talking about a day trip, a week trip, you're with your, with your friends out on, on an average paddle. Uh, some of the questions you can ask were, what were the highlights of your paddle? Uh, or what was the highlights of your day? The other question, that honest, good, transparent question is, what was the low point of the day? Or were there any disappointments with, with the day or with the paddle? And also, did we meet your expectations? Um, these questions, oh, and, and the, other, the other question too is, is there anything that you would do that you would change next time you did the same trip? Um, four super important and good questions that open up dialogue, and that's what you want. You want excellent communication and dialogue with your paddlers to, to learn from and experience, uh, uh, you know, or build upon your experience so that next time you do it better, so. Terrific, fantastic, yeah. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I think we've introduced two really great models here. One is from a big picture, we've introduced the peer uh, model of plan, educate, execute, and review as a big picture look at any expedition, whether it's a day trip or a multi-day trip. And then uh, we've introduced um, uh, the decision-making triangle as a way to navigate those transition zones uh, that exist um, as waypoints along your plan. Um, and then the other two things we've, um, you know, helped people or touched on in this conversation is, uh, is you know, uh, the importance of awareness around your comfort zone and uh, letting that help you stay in a place where you can make more uh, or better decisions. And then the other part is really how do I, how do I break down risk was whether it's acceptable or not. Um, so if you apply that sort of assumption of risk with the decision making triangle, it might help guide you um, in those transitions um, moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. 
I'd love to hear from uh, any of you. Let's open this up for a question and answer or discussion. You know, uh, what resonated with you or what models do you use to help you manage risk on the water when you're paddling with uh, your friends or in an institutional setting as a guide? While you guys are deciding what your question is or your insight is, can I encourage you all to take that, um, that decision-making triangle from track print it off and do an eight and a half by 11 and then take it to a staples and, and laminate it. And that way you can put it, you can put it under the bungee of your kayak and it can be a visual reminder um, for you as you're on the water, whether you're paddling solo or with a group of people, that's a fabulous tool to take with you. Terrific. In fact, what I'm going to think I'm going to do right now, um, Keith, is I'm going to add to that. Um, here's what we do at Track for expeditions: uh, is we also print on the other side of the decision-making triangle. Um, we print the passage plan format. Float plan, yeah. Um, so I'm going to put that float plan in a link here as well. So I invite you to take the float <laughs> plan, take the uh, take the decision-making triangle, uh, print them double-sided. Um, and uh, laminate those and keep those on your deck. Uh, a great model for, you know, employing the peer system. Um, and so with that, you know, float plan, it's a really effective way to inform everybody in your group exactly what you're doing. Um, and um, if you look at that, and maybe I can just bring it up and uh, just share it with you, um, is, uh, is this float plan, let me screen share this if I can. Um, is there's a section in the flow plan that says route description. And uh, let's see if I can screen share that. While he's doing that, does anyone have any questions or any insights you want to share? Keith, can uh, everyone hear me? Sure can, Brad. Go ahead. Okay, a great session, uh, guys. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, one of the little tools I use that would fit under your educate is the four lemon count. And just mm. ask, asking participants on the fly, if we're in a, you know, wave train or something like that, could, uh, you know, people just indicate on an index, one being, um, you know, a laugher, really, really easy, or panic mode, what specific no uh, lemon number would you attach to how you're feeling now? So one lemon, two lemon, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I find it's uh, even easier than trying to think of a, a color code system. Hmm. I like it. I like it. Yeah, F that fantastic. works. Fantastic. Brad, you know what that brings up for me is I often think about lemons in, in this way, um, is that uh, <laughs> is, is in, in, in risk management, is that anything, uh, you know, usually a scenario that unfolds that's really bad, that is deep trouble, usually isn't like one big decision. Uh, it's like, you know, three bad, you know, three, three poor decisions that compound, right? Um, and, you know, skipping over what might have seemed like a simple transition zone, not, not giving it the respect that it is that when you add one more failed transition decision, uh, it's going to add to it and make it worse. It's going to compound over time. So it really, uh, and I call those basically, you know, when you skip over a transition where you don't definitively make a, a, a well-informed decision at any of those transition points, that's a lemon. And things don't really go bad till you have a few lemons stacked up, but then things go really bad really fast. You're like, where did that come from? Oh, well, we made this you know, marginal decision and there we didn't make a decision and there we made a marginal decision. And when you add that up, it's uh, disastrous. <laughs> Great. Terrific. Um, so I'm going to add this. Uh, you should be able to see this um, this uh, passage plan now. And I want to add this route description here. And one thing I'll give you as a gold standard when you fill out the route description, the gold standard is this, is that while you're on shore, while your chart is in front of you, um, the route description should be something you should be able to navigate by without your chart. So if I were to like Write, a, write an effective route description and leave shore, and then it become totally dark and socked in. I should be able to navigate by that route description, knowing that I have to paddle uh, two seven zero degrees for 15 minutes at an assumed speed. And then I should be able to turn 45 degrees and paddle for 18 minutes um, on that trajectory. And I should be coming within 200 meters of a rock outcrop uh, on my right side. 
uh, and then I should turn to, you know, one six zero and paddle for 30 minutes uh, to my destination. And along the way, um, I should, you know, come over a shallow bank where I might expect waves to stand up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So use the route description as a gold, the gold standard for you is that you should be able to navigate that almost like an instrument rating uh, yeah. with just your compass. Uh, and that really gets you tied in to that route description in a way that you can anticipate what's going to happen and you can think about uh, how the geographic features or terrain features, um, re, you know, are overlaid with the meteorological scenario. As I come around the point, I should, whatever that northwest wind is, I'm going to feel it where I haven't felt it before, so anticipate that. Um, so write that in your route description that as you come around the point, expect any northwest exposure to, to present uh, to you. Um, great. That's all I got on that one. So you've got the, you've got the passage plan and the decision-making triangle. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, any other, uh, I'd love to hear from, uh, takeaways, if you will, from, uh, uh, from Ken or Connie um, about, um, uh, about risk management from their experience as a, um, things that they might, they saw on the, on the trip that they might uh, impart. I thought it was good that we got a briefing in the morning before we went out about what we were to expect and usually well sometimes it was weather or wind or you know it was something that we may not have known and it was explained very well um, with the chance to ask questions and then once we got out on the water or close to it there was always the feeling of being supported so you could go beyond your comfort zone because you knew somebody was there and um, we practiced rescues and stuff the first day so you know technically we shouldn't have been worried about anything because we could get rescued no matter what happened but it did it did take the edge off just knowing that there was so many good people around us all the time terrific I, i'd like to make i just like to acknowledge connie here connie and tish and um and and Jeannie were there um and uh, one of the things that they took on for themselves as a risk management uh, effort is that they know that they like to paddle together and they want to paddle together more. Um, and so, you know, at the end of a camp, we had an extra optional time for them to get back in the water. It's not easy to get back in the water um, after, you know, three or four days of paddling. Um, uh, but they seized every moment they could. And in those last moments, you know, that we made uh, coaches available to them, they grabbed a couple of coaches, they got on the water and they said, we are going to practice these rescues together. And we simply want the instructors to observe. We need mm -hmm. to know that we can do this on our own because if we can, it unleashes us to paddle um, on our own with confidence and safety and trust in each other. And it's just going to open up a world to them. So I just want to acknowledge you guys for that. You did a great job with that. That was a great risk management uh, uh, opportunity that you really seized. Nice work. Yeah, and I'm, I want to capitalize on that a little bit too, girls. You, you, um, you really emulated um, a, a, a true spirit of, of just wanting to learn. Um, every day you guys went out and you were like, just teach us, teach us, teach us, teach us. And I love that. You know, so often the, 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 the sport of kayaking can be, can create a base of a complacent mindset to the point where people, they get in their kayak, they paddle and they, they do a good forward stroke and they get from point A to point B and, and that's about as much as they challenge themselves. Um, whereas I've always encouraged people to say, hey, you know, when you're out, um, every trip you go out, you should try to engage some different type of um, skill that you haven't uh, really nailed down that's not innate to you so that um, it becomes innate. It becomes second nature for you. And so I think you guys have a, a trip coming up to Moline Lake, right, in Jasper? If we can book some uh, campsites. This is actually the campsite at the far end. Yeah. Um, on a trip I was on a couple years ago, and there's my red track, actually. Um, and, yeah, that's about 22 kilometers down the lake, and it's beautiful. But right now the campsites are getting a little scarce unless we get into the colder weather. But, um, anyway, we'll manage, eh, Tish? Yeah, so I think one of the key things there, um, and I think, the, you know, to, to clarify what you did in that is that, to, you know, you had demonstrated that you could pull off those rescues, no problem. Uh, but what you did is you took it a step further, and I think this is important for all of us, you know, being able to do a cowboy 
uh, reentry into your boat is one thing in flat, calm water. But mm -hmm. really, you need it's very beneficial for you to practice it in conditions uh, that are uh, more likely those things that you might encounter on the very edge of your limit of what you're willing to paddle in. Um, and being able to seize that opportunity with support, with instructors to go there and say, okay, this is the limit what I'm going to paddle in. Let's do the rescue now. <laughs> um, that's, that's, a, that's a really working uh, competency. It's, a, it's working within uh, the types of conditions you might be paddling in. Um, and with that, you can more effectively set, okay, I know that I can, that I can do a reentry in force four conditions. Um, so that means I can now paddle in force four conditions. Excellent. Um, uh, nice work. Uh, Keith, any other additions from folks? Questions? Contributions? Everyone should be able to uh, uh, chime in here. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you want. Okay, good. Francine, go ahead. So I'm still in the Yuki area. I figured that um, I would make the best out of this camp by while my skills are fresh to to get out there and get a little bit out of my comfort zone uh, and do my first uh, ocean kayaking solo trip. Um, and I really spend a lot of time planning and um, with navigation skills. Um, so really trying to utilize as best as I could all of the tools that were given at this camp. So um, that was super exciting to me um, to know that I now have built a confidence and a competence. And I went out there and paddled 16 kilometers yesterday and um, really noticed the transition zone and I kept reassessing, um, doing a lot of that and it felt great. And one thing that I would add for the planning is um, I did talk to some locals that have been living here and very familiar with, with this part and um, got some really good tips uh, about, you know, told them where my skills were and um, that also felt really reassuring to get some of the locals perspective and some uh, really good nautical maps. So I'm um, feeling great. And tomorrow I'm doing Barkley Sound. So I'm <laughs> loving being around here and making the best out of it. Awesome. Fantastic. Courageous, uh, courageous trip there, uh, Francine. I'm sure you'll be safe. I'm, I'm confident you'll make really uh, sound decisions and, um, uh, uh, you know, the most important thing I think uh, is to recognize that uh, when you're in paddling in those conditions in that area um, is to, you know, release your attachment to a timetable. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's an excellent point, Hans, and something worth touching base on is um, when you are planning a trip, you guys, whether it's a day trip or a week trip, um, this sport is, is actually not a destinational sport. This is a journey sport. And uh, so if you, as Hans said, de detach any sense of schedule from your, from your plan and also, also destination and, and just allow you to be in the present and make decisions that are best for that present time, um, your, your trip will be a lot safer. So don't think destinational, think journey. Cool. Awesome. Great. So what I'd, leave, I'd like to leave folks with as a takeaway um, is, uh, is to constantly evaluate uh, those transitional points. Know where the transitional points are. Evaluate uh, uh, constantly at them in the most objective way. Lean on the tools and frameworks that we've given you to really systematize that process. Because, uh, you know, if you can do, if you can systematize it, it's going to allow you to more effectively make decisions when things get weird. You know, Keith was a professional paramedic for many years. And one of the critical things about that is that to, you're, everything is so systematized that when you're into the, in the most like demanding and upsetting situation, you can still pull it off because you're just leaning on the frameworks, you're leaning on the system. And that's super important. Um, and so, using the systems when things are calm, when they're benign, making the routine. It's like learning a new language and developing fluency around it. Um, so that's why I invite you to do in terms of risk management is to, is to uh, let it be a language for you uh, that you can become fluent with 
And you can only do that using it in calm conditions so that it does serve you well when things get really weird, uh, mm -hmm. really fast. Well put, well put. Great. Terrific. Well, um, if there's nothing else, I think this will be a wrap to the, uh, to the, to the podcast keys to avoiding deep trouble. Uh, if you're interested in growing your skills, uh, there's a lot of opportunities with track. We have the skills accelerator program, uh, that is a, a do it together, uh, opportunity with our track foundations program. If you're not on the track foundations program, I invite you to sign up for that. Uh, you can do it on the track website. It's where you'll find, find all the foundational skills that you need uh, to really ensure that uh, uh, your uh, foundational elements are, are, are done uh, technically accurate uh, with good style and that you have um, the tools that you need in your toolbox to, uh, to get out there and live a life unleashed. Mm. Awesome. And uh, also want to give a big thanks to those people who, uh, uh, put out their time and resources um, and commitments to coming to the Pacific Rim Surf Camp. Uh, we anticipate having another one in May. Um, if you want to get on the waiting list for that, uh, you can. You can reach out to, to track um, at, uh, at uh, Jason at trackkayaks.com and uh, you can get on the waiting list for uh, our next camp, which I think is going to be uh, possibly run in May. Um, and just raise your hand if you're interested in that uh, detailed skills development we can uh, we can find a camp that's the best fit for you um so anyway thanks everyone really appreciate it um uh get out there and um uh we'll see you either on the uh uh, uh i think wellness equals water episode next friday or, or i think the following friday it is the uh three steps to kayaking uh and otherwise we'll see you back here next month